Good morning, everybody in the, uh, the US, and good afternoon, everybody in uh, Europe. My name is Anders Åström. I'm a senior uh, fellow at the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council, and I'm very happy to offer you an excellent uh, session on the Ukrainian economy uh, today. Uh, during the summer, we have seen many steps going backwards with regard to economic policy uh, in Ukraine. And our big question uh, today is really how bad is the situation uh, and can we see any uh, li light in the tunnel. For this, I can offer you a wonderful uh, panel today of, uh, of, of four uh, people. And these people are Alexander Daniluk, former Minister of Finance of uh, Ukraine and also former National Defense and Security uh, Advisor. He will join us on the phone with certain technical problems. We have uh, Timothy Ash, who's uh, a sovereign strategist at uh, Blue Bay Asset Management in uh, London, who's an outstanding specialist on East European uh, economies. Uh, Timothy <coughs> Milovanov, who is uh, uh, a former minister of, of uh, uh, economic development, trade and agriculture in the in the Zelensky uh, government uh, until uh, March. And we have uh, Aljona uh, Bilan, who's the chief economist uh, of uh, Dragon Capital, the dominant uh, uh, brokerage in, uh, in Ukraine. And in my view, uh, the, the best of uh, uh, banking uh, economists in, uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine. So let me start with this, uh, a few general questions about the uh, the state of economy and reform. Uh, Aljona, what is the real state of the Ukrainian economy today? What would you consider the main features of it? Briefly. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, first of all, and uh, uh, hello to everyone um, on this uh, uh, excellent event. Uh, um, well, you know that if, if one looks at the economic indicators, just at the, you know, the, the tables, the economic situation may may be described as nearly perfect, as, as perfect as it could be in the current environment. Um, so Ukraine is passing through the ongoing crisis with, uh, with quite small uh, economic uh, losses. So that there, there was definitely a drop in output in the second quarter, but it was relatively mild, so around 10% quarter on quarter, which is comparable to what the US experienced uh, and uh, uh, is below uh, the decline uh, experienced by the uh, Europe, by the EU, and not, not to mention the UK, which, which posted 20% drop. And now what we observe in the economy is a very quick V-shaped recovery. Like on our estimate, many sectors uh, already returned back to the pre-crisis level, to February uh, 20 level. That includes uh, the big sectors such as industry and also the retail turnover, which is an indicator for consumer uh, demand. And this was because of the uh, very quick uh, global upturn, but also because uh, the national um, lockdown, the quarantine, af uh, affected the domestic um, income of population not that dramatically as um, I expected and as many expect. So, and uh, you know that uh, the the Ukraine's external position is also very strong. Uh, the the current account is now in a surplus, in fact, big surplus of nearly four percent of GDP. This crisis was unique in the sense that the uh, Ukraine Central Bank was accumulating reserves, uh, not, not really losing reserves. And now the reserves uh, above the IMF adequacy metrics. So generally, I would describe it as, as a uh, relatively good situation. And all of that implies, implies that Ukraine has a lot of economic buffers to withstand uh, potential new, new shocks or even you know, kind of domestic, uh, not not very wise policies. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Aliona. So you are giving a pretty uh, positive picture of the real economy as it stands now. And uh, let me then turn to you, uh, uh, Timothy Ash. Uh, uh, you have written very critically about uh, the economic policies uh, ever since uh, uh, President Zelensky sacked uh, the Honcharuk government uh, uh, last March. What is your take? Uh, uh, what you see as the greatest the shortcoming of <coughs> the current economic policy? 
if you go back to the Poroshenko period and you go back to that election campaign with Zelensky, I mean, I think many people criticised Poroshenko not for macro stabilisation. I mean, that was already achieved under the previous administration. The big, the big, uh, the big disappointment with Poroshenko was all the stuff around business environment. It was about rule of law. Uh, is about corruption, all those kind of things that the Poroshenko administration didn't really deliver on. It didn't deliver meaningful change. And, you know, there was basic macro stabilization in the Poroshenko. So basically, current account position, external finance position were okay. And reserves were kind of, you know, they built, they were, they were a, a decent buffer. Fiscal was pretty strong. Public debt was on the downward the, the trajectory, but growth real GDP growth from a very low base was really disappointing, right? And, and, and myself, you guys, most of the guys on the panel, uh, highlighted, you know, the question, you know, the question was, why was that? And the reason was that it wasn't rule of law, corruption was terrible, uh, Prussian hadn't done enough about it. And so, you know, Zelensky was hired, he was elected on the mandate to do just that, to basically, you know, fight corruption, you know, address all the issues around rule of law, make Ukraine a really good place to do business, so foreign investors would pile in, you know, growth would go from sort of one to two percent trend to maybe five, six percent. Uh, and Zelensky had this wonderful opportunity, right? I mean, the guy was elected with a huge popular mandate for change, for reform. You know, he won uh, the Rada election, so he had a majority there, big majority. He had uh, lots of great technocrats in the administration. I mean, all the, you know, uh, Timothy and Alex were part of that team. They joined up, they signed on the dotted line. We were really hopeful that finally, you know, the final, the final leg of the story would, would be delivered. Uh, and I should also say that, you know, Ukraine had a lot of, you know, goodwill on the part of uh, uh, official, inv official creditors, but also institutional investors. I mean, guys like us, portfolio managers bought into that story, you know. Uh, so we're all really, really hopeful. And in the end, it's been a huge disappointment, right? I mean, what we see, what I see is across the board, institutions being institutional strength being eroded uh, you know you see the management changes at the national bank of ukraine you see the change of the customs agency i mean imagine three finance ministers in a year and there's talk about a fourth finance minister i mean what what country has four finance ministers in a year and the question is why change why why were any of these changes made why why was the cabinet reformed i mean i i asked someone close to the Zelensky administration to explain you know, all the cabinet changes and reshuffles. And the basic question was, name me one position where a minister or a public official was changed and it was an upgrade. Just highlight one person where the actual person brought in was better than the one that was replaced. And the person couldn't, couldn't actually identify one position. So it was change for the sake of change, for loyalty, to play to oligarchs. I, I don't know the reason, but, but you know, I, I think it's pretty clear that, a, that, that all the anti-corruption uh, infrastructure that was put in place by the Poroshenko administration has been undermined, eroded, worn away, and, and the, the institutional strength that what the, the few places that, that Poroshenko succeeded in terms of building institutional strength, like the National Bank of Ukraine, have gradually been whittled away. And I think, you know, in the end, going back to my basic point, you know, Ukraine needs growth. What does it need for growth? Great, a good business environment. It needs institutions. It needs you know, rule of law, that kind of stuff. And I just see backtracking across the line. Now, that, that may not result in an immediate crisis because the macro buffers are there. You know, it might not matter that the IMF is not going to lend any money this year, which seems the, the most likely outcome is no IMF money and maybe no IMF money next year. It doesn't really matter. But you know, in the end, it's so disappointing that the, the huge achievements that were made, the, the few and the, but huge achievements that were made in the last five years have been eroded. And, and I think the risk, you know, it may, there may not be a crisis this year, but a crisis will brew. You know, those, those buffers will be eroded over the next six months, a year. And, and, and that leaves the country, you know, vulnerable, I guess. Thank you very much. That's a very, a very clear uh, answer. So, uh, Alex, I'm not sure, do you, uh, uh, can we hear you now? Uh, Alexander Daniljok, you have, uh, you were Minister of Finance for uh, uh, three years, 2016 uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, 19, 
uh, what, what you say about uh, the situation. I hope that you are connected now. No, sorry, you can't. I'll take uh, Timothy first. I, uh, I can't hear you, uh, Alex. Uh, uh, Timothy, you were Minister of Economic Development from August last year until um, March uh, this year, Economic Development, Trade and uh, Agriculture. And what is uh, your view? What did you accomplish? And uh, what do you see as the greatest uh, uh, shortcomings now? I think it was a fantastic time uh, for us. Um, I essentially felt, uh, and it was true, that I had an absolute mandate to do any kind of structural reforms that uh, we thought was possible. Um, you know, I was, uh, it, it is a little bit like an you know, economic revolution, at least that was the feeling. That feeling very quickly eroded, and I'll comment on why that happened in my view but essentially you know when i was proposed or offered to be a minister i had several days to um to prepare for an interview with the president and his team and they asked for a couple of large slides big picture ideas we offered six directions the three of them you very much you know might know one was the land market reform and another one was privatization. The third one was uh, labor code uh, liberalization. We had an outdated Soviet Union labor code and a lot of other things, but you know, um, international trade, uh, um, investment uh, climate uh, and a number of other structural things. But basically six uh, large directions, structural. And the president said, go ahead guys. Go ahead, you have the mandate. And we did, you know, it took me two weeks. I was in the office for two weeks. On September 15th, we submitted to the cabinet the law for the land market. And uh, just to put out, you know, everyone in the context, you know, it has been stonewalled for 10 years before that, you know. And then there was a little bit of resistance, but on the 25th of September, so 26 days into the office, the cabinet passed uh, this, uh, res approved this uh, draft of the law and sent it to the parliament. So, you know, and then there was the first reading and then it got stalled in the parliament. So I think what happens is this, if you look at the parliament, it very clearly mimics what was happening with the cabinet. The first two, three, four months, things were going through uh, very quickly, tons of uh, changes, uh, very, you know, very much focused on the structural um, um, distortions present in the Ukrainian economy. You know, there is an upbeat mood, you know, that things are actually moving forward. And then people who were standing to lose from these structural reforms actually found the way to stall everything. And it was not an upfront attack on it. It was, you know, a strategy of thousand cuts. And um, to support my perspective, you know, look at what happened with the law on the land market. You know, it got delayed in the committee. You know, every step of the way was a fight. People used every kind of technique from intimidating members of parliament at their localities, you know, yeah, uh, in, front of, in, in front of their voters, to, um, you know, Yulia Timoshenko break, breaking a microphone uh, at the committee meeting to make it impossible for the committee, simply physically impossible, to vote on amendments, to uh, opposition block uh, submitting thousands, you know, a thousand of amendments, which are basically semantic, uh, you know, perturbations uh, the, uh, done by an algorithmic program uh, using every possible, you know, filibustering, de facto filibustering without any limited, you know, any, uh, any deadline on this, filibustering the entire process. So similar things were happening inside the government. So at some point, the government becomes essentially dysfunctional. You know, by the time of the late November to December, we were hitting the roadblocks. You know, when I started doing the, the I managed to uh, move 100 companies uh, for privatization from the National Academy of Sciences. It's a corrupt institution uh, and no minister prior has been able to move a single company from them. We, we had so much power, we could. That all got approved. And somewhere in November, December and January, we started seeing sabotage from, you know, at the medium level, at the intermediate level, at every, so at, at, at every possible direction that we were doing. You know, labor code was a good example. So that law essentially made it to the parliament, but once we were sacked, 
was recalled uh, using the procedures of the rule and it's that that reform is that but the land market got through so they and um, the privatization is half half you know we sent uh, 900 companies to privatization 400 return you know were reversed but 500 are there let's say um, there is a, a monopoly on alcohol production and major corruption industry in Ukraine is broken. Uh, there is privatization going on. So things which were done in the first three, four, five months, they're actually going through and uh, that they will happen. So my view is that it's, uh, it's just the deep state regrouped, got support from oligarchs and uh, sort of realized that the status quo is about to change and they need really to fight back and then, uh, you know, the leadership of the country has made uh, the choice to sort of revert to the basics. Thank you very much, Timothy. I think that this is a good point to move over to Alex. I think that we have Alex Daniel York now on the line. And my question to you is, uh, uh, what is this about Ukraine? We have seen it time and time again. Uh, attempts are going down, uh, are being done uh, to clean up uh, corruption. And now we are seeing a lot going the opposite way, as, uh, uh, as uh, Tim uh, clarified. Well, uh, Tim Ape pointed positively out that still some things are going forward. What is the problem with Ukraine? Is it the oligarchs? Is it the bureaucracy? Or is it something about political culture or something else? Well, I've been in, in our know, in, in, in politics. Um, several times. And um, when I look back, I see one um, common problem over the last years, which is um, lack of genuine drive to reform the country from the very top. It was the case for, for uh, for the four presidents, pretty much, I think even for all presidents. So, even, there, even, even if there is initial attempt to reform the country, very soon interest is lost. And as a result, most of the reforms were done, pretty much they were enforced, imposed from outside as a part of the nationalities for the financial support, political support. And if that just doesn't work, it's not effective. Another reason, I think, for the problem is lack of leadership um, on the pretty much working level. You know, we have a very large club of reformers in Ukraine, but not many real reformers. Those who are willing to take responsibility and drive the reforms through despite all the challenges there is. That's a, that's a quite a serious uh, problem. I remember uh, when during the presidential campaign of Zelensky, I was talking to investors, and, including Tim, and uh, basically was, I think, quite, quite honest, saying, look, Zelensky is an opportunity. If it all depends on success or not success, it will depend on the team that he was built around him. And uh, in September, I realized that, that his building team based on close friends, you know, some uh, weak politicians who will do whatever she says. And that's clearly for me, uh, with this team, you cannot do reforms. And uh, if we consider, for example, two extremes, I have great respect for the team, for Timothy for, for Milano. But honestly, for me, the Gonshiro government was politically weak inexperienced, it wasn't corrupt, but it was naive. And for me, it was equally ineffective than other government, which was strong, very experienced, 
extremely corrupt and very cynical. Yeah, uh, what is missing is actually uh, Alex, uh, I hear you, but strong experience. Can you speak closer to the government? Alex, can you speak closer to the, 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 the mic to the phone that you, your uh, sound is uh, very poor? But uh, we get your message. Uh, there is no will uh, or very little will at the top of really reform. And this, of course, goes back to President uh, Zelensky himself and the people in the presidential office, uh, as you have said. You have been dealing extensively with uh, uh, Privat Bank. You were uh, in charge uh, together uh, with uh, uh, the head of the National Bank, uh, uh, Valeria Gontarieva, in uh, uh, December uh, 2016 of nationalizing Privat Bank. Um, and uh, uh, we are now seeing that the Ukraine, uh, new Ukrainian authorities are pursuing uh, uh, Igor Kalamoyskog and Gennady Bagalyubov, the two uh, main uh, owners of uh, uh, Privat Bank, while these are being pursued uh, in the civil or criminal cases in the, the US, in uh, uh, the, the UK, and in uh, Israel. Uh, of, uh, is uh, Ukraine law enforcement simply too weak to uh, prosecute? Uh, 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 Kalamoyski and Bagalyubov, what is this? We can't hear you at all now. Can be closer to the phone. Are you closer to the phone? Sorry, I, I'm afraid that we have uh, uh, missed uh, uh, you Would somebody else uh, pick up on this? Uh, a question about private bank. I'm happy to comment, uh, Timothy Milovanov here. Um, so I, I think you asked a very pointed question on whether the law enforcement is too weak to prosecute uh, powerful people. I think that the law enforcement is too weak to prosecute even uh, people like me who do not have much, uh, you know, political connections. And, you know, my main def defense would probably be a Facebook post, you know, complaining that there is some uh, attack on me uh, if that were to happen. So, in fact, I think there are the serious problems with simply maintaining, you know, proving that the chain of evidence is intact, you know, while in custody already, you know, uh, if, uh, if there is some evidence that this evidence is not tempered and properly interpreted. So there are technical issues. The, the competences of the uh, law enforcement agencies, apart, you know, just uh, leave alone the political will to do anything, you know, and, or pressure on decision makers in law enforcement or judges. Just the ability to, you know, you don't need to push that much. You just need to have good lawyers, you know, and, uh, and in the court, they will destroy on either procedural re, uh, or on substantive uh, uh, grounds the arguments against, uh, against you. It has been extremely difficult for Ukrainian authority to prosecute anyone, you know, not only politically related people, but also, yeah. let's say, some uh, people okay, who are okay. involved yeah. in... Uh, who were involved in, let's say, Maidan, in shooting people, you know, not even the oligarchs, you know, let alone oligarchs. And now oligarchs have uh, resources, are politically engaged, they have uh, MPs on their payroll in the parliament. Of course, it is uh, close to impossible to proceed. I hear, uh, have a question here from Jaroslav. Yeah. Okay. If you are on the line uh, you're, uh, on Zoom, you're most welcome to send yeah. uh, uh, comments. By, uh, uh, online to us. Yeah, sure. From Jaroslav uh, Kinnak saying, uh, President Zelensky has lost control of his uh, uh, government. The head of the presidential office has taken control of government uh, uh, appointments uh, uh, and domestic and international uh, policy. Is that uh, the case? I pass this on to Alex. I hear you are back online. Yeah. Um, Anders. Uh, do, you, do you mind if I quickly comment on the on um, on uh, Privat Bank because it's very important. I um I would agree with I would agree with Team that our law enforcement is weak. But also, and I experienced it myself, it is compromised. It is compromised 
Because during nationalization, and during and after nationalization, we were you know, suing Kolomoisky and Pogolubov in courts in Ukraine, and actually outside of Ukraine, the law enforcement in Ukraine was on the side of Kolomoisky. Because they really liked his money, they really liked his political support, he, they really liked his media support. And that's actually a much bigger problem of weakness. They just work for those who have money. And so it's very difficult to prosecute someone if the law enforcement that's supposed to work in the interest of state works in the interest of uh, private money. So that, that's one of the biggest reasons. And Kalamoysk and Bogolubov, they fighting quite uh, in Ukraine as well against four cases, but they do it much more successfully than, than they would do in the uh, UK, for example, United States or Israel. That was the reason why initially, the, the, you know, we had a decision that regardless of what's happening in Ukraine, we submit, we will go after Kolomoisky uh, in, in UK and in US. It was a deliberate decision that now proves that it was, uh, time proved it was the right decision. Because regardless of political changes in Ukraine, we will get the um, you know independent ruling in UK and in United States. So that's I think that's important to um, uh, to mention. Yeah, and thank then, you very much. Uh, I think that the answer from both of you, Timothy and Alex, is quite clear. Uh, uh, the, the rule of law does not function in Ukraine, and uh, you don't see any the perspectives of it in the short uh, term. So I would then like to turn to the other major institution, I think Tim mentioned it in your uh, initial dis discussion, that is the National Bank of Ukraine. We have now seen the governor of the National Bank being sacked and um, forced to resign. And uh, four out of six of uh, the members of the board of the National Bank uh, have been uh, exchanged. Uh, what does that mean, uh, Tim? How, how serious uh, uh, is it? Uh, what change in policy do you see? Actually, uh, a couple of things here. If, if I can go back a little bit to what Timofeev said and actually Alex said in terms of reform, sure. right? So, so you know, Zelensky, we wanted, to t we wanted him to take on the stuff that Poroshenko had done successfully, right? We wanted him to push on with reforms, right? And we, we took it for granted that the National Bank of Ukraine was one of the success stories, one of these institutions implanted, right? And and so Alex kind of uh, you know you know identifies the difficulty of the Honchuk administration, you know, difficulty in pushing reform forward. But I think what's interesting is not only is Zelensky the Zelensky administration not pushed on with reform, really, but it's actually gone back and undermined you know many of the reform achievements of the previous administration. So you know. And I guess the you know if you go back to the the national the National Bank of Ukraine changes right so if you go back to the, the 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 reasons for the change of governor right I mean you know two reasons were given basically in the RADA right I mean all the main reason was given was monetary and exchange rate policy right the the central bank hadn't cut interest rates enough inflation wasn't high enough growth was too low the currency was too strong uh, I mean that was given as the main reason and, and there wasn't really very much about other reasons that I, I sense was actually the main reason why there was change at the central bank. Interestingly, you know, we, we now have a new governor, which I think we need to give the benefit of the doubt. I, I've never met him. I don't know him personally. You know, um, you know, we, we need to see him in office and how he performs with his new team. Um, but actually, on the on the substantive criticisms of Schmolly and the team in terms of interest rates and exchange rate policy. There's been no change. There's no difference, right? So, so why why was there a need to change? You know, not just change the governor. I mean, you know, a wholesale uh, clearing out of the successful management team of the National Bank of Ukraine. I mean, what's the point? Why would you do that, right? Why mess with something that is working when you've got so many other things you need to sort out, right? And in the end, and I'd link it to the forty seven K issue. So. What's the, you know, I mean, essentially what we see here is uh, that there seems to be a campaign by, by someone, right? So it's either oligarchic, uh, old, old school sort of banking interests and, and maybe pro-Russian interests 
so yeah, the, desi the, the desire is basically to res reverse the 2015 2017 banking nationalization so uh, so let, banking let, reforms let so it's, let, they, on the 47k issue because i don't uh, think that uh, everybody knows uh, uh, what it is uh, so what the case is that uh, since april uh, members of uh, management boards and the supervisory boards of the state-owned companies uh, are not being allowed to be paid more than seventeen hundred dollars a month this is also applied from uh, judges and mps and uh, prosecutors so this was thousands of uh, uh, p people. On the 28th of August, the Constitutional Court uh, decided in its wisdom that uh, judges, that means themselves, should be accepted from, uh, from this. But this is not retroactive, so they would uh, only lose four months of uh, uh, salaries. I'm a member of the Supervisory Board of a Railroad. We have not been paid anything uh, since uh, the 1st of uh, April, so it's not only 47k, it's a zero, and I don't think that we will be paid anything more, because there is a strong will to uh, get rid of corporate governance. We have uh, the precedent statement from the 4th of March that is uh, supervised in, is being paid uh, too much, and that uh, foreigners uh, sh shouldn't be there, so it comes straight from uh, the, the government. But uh, let me turn this question to um, uh, uh, Timothy and Alex. Uh, I got here a question from Dmitry Skurko, National News Agency of uh, uh, Ukraine, and uh, he uh, want, uh, wonders more specifically who uh, sa sabotaged uh, uh, your reform uh, efforts uh, in spite of an overwhelming majority in the parliament. And I quote the last part of his question, does it mean the gradual backsliding uh, of the Zelensky team, including in parliament and in the government, away from promise and obligations done during election campaign? I think that you already answered that uh, question with a yes, but if either of you would like to uh, comment on it. Timothy? Okay, yeah, okay, I'm happy uh, to jump in here. You know, there is sabotage, sabotage will be there. I think um, um, the faction is very large. Uh, what I mean by that, the parliamentary faction. So a lot of them got bribed uh, by different vested interests. And some of this is uh, local bribing, uh, temporarily local. You know, on specific law, there will be resistance or just the opposite, uh, paying people to get protection uh, amendment or change something. But there's also systematic bribing where um, people form sub-factions and uh, start representing interests of uh, different groups in Ukraine, business groups, political groups. Um, in, in addition, there is a very effective rhetoric for, uh, from opposition, from uh, this opposition bloc from pro-Russian parties, um, and uh, similarly effective polarizing um, rhetoric uh, from Poroshenko's bloc. And very ineffective rhetoric from parties uh, like Golos uh, of Svetoslav Vakarchuk or by, uh, you know, individual MPs who are very pro-Western. So essentially the pro-Western or pro-structural reform, pro-market reform voice inside the parliament is very weak and uh, is not financially supported. No major oligarch is now given, or may, no major business group is given serious support for reformists um, inside the political process. So it's all reverting to the status quo. So, you know, it's a, I would, you know, there's of course uh, the issue of leadership. It's very clear that the uh, leadership, uh, pro Western or pro market leadership is not there. It's more of a stand that, um, you know, I'm trying to be a centrist, I'm trying to balance things, I'm trying to be a peacemaker. That's the uh, position that um, Zelensky has taken, um, let's say, within the year of his presidency. And so he's trying to be, you know, uh, position himself in the media, in the median, exactly in the middle between uh, very pro Western and very pro. Eastern, uh, you know, policy agendas. 
Uh, therefore, everything is becoming a status quo. So I wouldn't say that there is, you know, uh, there are vested interests, but it's all individual. It's not very well coordinated. Everyone sabotages something small. There is no clear strategy of what we need to change. Um, and therefore, everything gets stalled. So I think it's a reversal to status quo and uh, a medium kind of uh, a centrist approach to let's not change th things, not disturb them. The, the picture you provide is yeah. one of the general yeah. energy and the administration and not that the main problem is the oligarchs and uh, the president seems to be a, a matter of irrelevance. Alex, you wanted to say something on this? Well, yeah, I think uh, it maybe uh, resonates with what uh, Timothy was saying. Um, I see the biggest problem is that in country, in Ukraine at the moment, there is no architect. There is no one who actually who defines where country is uh, moving. Clearly, it's not the president. There is no one at any level. And so when there is no sense of direction, um, you know, this basically, you know, some system, you know, you know where the country should go. Then uh, Ukraine becomes a place where there are some small battles um, played, which are lost. And those battles, for example, opposition, they have all interests. They want to discredit the integration with West. And, for example, the salary cap that you mentioned is clearly... Uh, a, a way to do that because they would be just happy to see real professional living to provide the rewards and uh, some kind of people stepping in and that would discredit the reform. You know, they they do everything uh, and to discredit it and they're quite successful because there is no pushback. For example, yeah. Pashanka is also has quite, quite more agenda. Hello? Yeah, uh, just me. Uh, yeah. Like, Hello? Are you saying that Medvedchuk and Boyko with their pro-Russian opposition platform for life, that they are really driving the politics now? I've noticed that Zelensky, a servant of the people, in a number of important recent election uh, votes on, uh, on uh, anti-corruption have voted with uh, the opposition platform for life. Is that so? I think so. I think they have uh, an enormous, enormous influence at this stage. And this is for the same reason, because there is no pushback. You know, whoever wants to play their game based on their interest, they're doing this. And the central government is extremely weak, and they're just losing out. You know, I've, just, uh, I've seen what, for example, Nidichuk is doing on his TV channels. They are incredibly effective incredibly effective, effective in their propaganda. You know, saying that the, the, the country is managed from the United States or from the EU, you know, the external management, you know, the supervisory board is, you know, the presence of foreigners supervisory board is just the element of that. And it's just, they just, you know, it, this is a very effective um, model. And as you see, for example, um, the reason, the reason, uh, Opposition on the two block, you know, uh, position block, voted together with Sluga Narota on some, uh, to block some anti corruption or backtrack on some anti corruption uh, reforms. Indeed. That's actually an um, article quite, quite logical, right? Because for opposition, this is, you know, clearly two reasons. First, it irritates the West up to the point that it could stop the um, in, you know, the financial support, for example, IMF and bilateral or EU. So from that point, and second, some of the people actually could be target of uh, of Nabu, and they by by targeting Nabu, you know, they basically uh, you know try to avoid the future or existing responsibility. Or um, why, if you ask me, why should another vote for it? Well, if you look who voted for this, and the people who connected either with. Uh, for example, with, uh, with Kolomoisky, they would clearly understand that he might have a similar interest. You know, he doesn't like West anymore because that's the threat may come from. And second, you know, he's being investigated by Nabu, uh, also including in, uh, in, in private bond case. So, like, there are a lot of vested interests now at play, and unfortunately, they are winning over central government. 
because Zelensky does not have a strong position. Thank you, thank you very much. I see here we are getting it's uh, uh, Mivichuk plus Kalamoyski that are here being perceived as the uh, strong forces. But let us come back a bit to the more economic issues. Uh, Aljona, uh, one of the big issues that is being discussed uh, all the time is will there be a um, new, uh, new IMF agreement? You recently wrote in one of your reports that you think that there will uh, be a new IMF tranche, I'm sorry, I should say a new IMF tranche because the agreement is there from the uh, summer. Uh, at the end uh, of the, this, uh, this year, uh, why do you think this will come about uh, when the, the situation looks as we have heard um, from the others? Yeah, the situation with, uh, with the IMF is, is really kind of fluent, I would say. and. Um, uh, well, uh, the, initially there were concerns about the central bank uh, uh, independence and about this, uh, uncertainty about the future policy after the rotation of the governor and uh, board members. But it seemed that these concerns uh, have uh, dissipated, and uh, um, it looks like the uh, le new leadership of the of the NBU is very much interested in the IMF program uh, because it's, it's a prerequisite for uh, financial stability. And um, I don't think that the, the policies uh, will change substantially as long the as long as the IMF the program kind of remains a realistic prospect for Ukraine. And um, I think it, it it does remain a realistic prospect uh, despite all the kind of uh, problems in other areas, especially now in anti-corruption sphere, uh, is because um, uh, Ukraine has uh, quite big fiscal funding needs. Uh, both till the end of this year and uh, uh, and especially next year, and uh, I doubt it will be possible to uh, to really to fill this funding needs without the IMF program and without the access to um, to external uh, markets. Like next year, Ukraine has to has to deal with 17 billion US dollars of um, uh, budget deficit and debt redemption. So this is a, uh, what we call the fiscal funding needs. Um, and definitely the domestic market will not be able to provide that uh, financing. And um, I think that the, the administration was illusioned really that they can go ahead without the IMF just because the global markets are so favorable and Ukraine is going through this crisis with, with this minimum losses and the terms of trade is really, really great. It's uh, the highest level since, um, uh, I think, eight years. Um, and that creates an impression that everything is so good and we can go forward without the IMF and uh, uh, um, do whatever we want, but it's not the case. And this uh, um, this illusion will dissipate soon when when it will be clear that the budget, uh, that the financing for the budget is not sufficient. And I think that this illusion will dissipate quite soon uh, because the, the budget deficit, the cash deficit will widen sharply in December, and maybe already in November there will be shortage of uh, currency on the government's uh, uh, accounts. Uh, so I expect that the uh, IMF tranche by the year end, and I think that the program will continue uh, uh, into next year, though with delays. Thank you very much. You are taking the pessimistic view, Tim. As I read from your comments, you are taking the pessimistic view. So give us your case. I, I, I've heard the rhetoric from. Uh... From various officials that, uh, that the reviews may start soon and that the money's, you know, they can still at least get one tranche. I just don't see it, right? I mean, look at the track record of relations between Ukraine and the IMF. I mean, even, even in the good times during the reformers, right? I mean, re reviews, how many, how many reviews were conducted during the year for the EFF? So I just struggle. The list is so long, right? I mean, the 47K issue has not been resolved completely yes yet uh it doesn't as far as i'm aware the the lifting of the cap you know doesn't relate to all state-owned enterprises just as state-owned banks there's the issue about minimum wage the budget there's the spending of covid money on 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 road uh, roads road infrastructure and then there's the the backtracking on anti-corruption institutions i just don't see why the fund you know unless unless they see real, real commitments uh, from, uh, you know, Zelensky promised all this stuff, right? He promised, 
the IMF MD that he would uh, defend the independence of the central bank. I mean, I think maybe the IMF assumed that would mean he would keep the existing management in place. That's been more or less completely changed. He, 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 he uh, promised he would push on with fighting corruption. And what we see is erosion of mostly all the existing anti-corruption. Uh, so I don't think the fund are going to be desperate to kind of kick on with, uh, uh, with the next mission. I think they're going to play hardball. And why wouldn't they? I mean, you know, um, I think the policymakers in Ukraine need to be made to understand that they need to do stuff. They need to defend the reforms that have already been uh, implemented and they need to, to actually do more, make, make the business environment better. Everything I see so far is business environment is going to be eroded from any improvements that we saw previously. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's no IMF money until the middle of next year. And actually, interestingly, Probably the, the thing to watch for is the U.S. election. So, you know, clearly this administration is not interested in, in, uh, in reform in Ukraine or fighting corruption in Ukraine. It will be interesting when, if Biden wins the U.S. presidential election, if he's still interested in Ukraine, obviously he was hugely interested when he was vice president, and whether he'll, he will take an active interest to work with the IMF and work with the European Union to try and get the reform agenda back on track. And I think Alex mentioned uh, he was skeptical, I guess, about external anchors for reform. Uh, but I would be hopeful that the U.S. would take a more uh, a more active approach to Ukraine to try and defend the reforms and push on with with uh, with with uh, further reforms uh, in Ukraine. Let me come in and just say that I'm even more pessimistic. Uh, to me, the situation now is like October 2010 after Yanukovych had had the Constitutional Court abolishing the Constitution, which seems uh, as uh, much uh, oxymoron uh, as you, you can have. I don't see any reformist tendencies, and uh, I think that uh, Alex got it uh, very clearly that it's Bilvechuk uh, uh, and Kalamorski, who are the two people who are driving government policy uh, now, and uh, uh, whoever is around uh, Zelensky does uh, not oppose that. Uh, so I don't think that we are looking to them. We recently heard about this bizarre delegation that was supposed to come to the, uh, Washington to lobby before IMF uh, money. This is exactly the thing that uh, Yanukovych did every half, half a year, sending uh, uh, six, seven ministers to Washington because he thought one needed more lobbyism in order to influence uh, uh, Washington. The IMF doesn't work like this. I don't think that these people have any uh, understanding of this. Uh, what do you say, Aljona? Oh, well, no, no, I think okay. that, yeah. I agree that there is a downside risk to this kind of to, to, to my base case uh, projection or, or base case kind of scenario uh, on the on the IMF. Um, but uh, again, I think that the situation now is really dependent on the on the central bank uh, and on the position of the um, of the its uh, new leadership about the whether they will be ready to finance the budget deficit or to help the uh, the government to finance the budget deficit or not. So, um, well, it seems that the central bank is really not changing its uh, policies, and I think they will not be doing some kind of QE type uh, operations uh, uh, at least this year. And that's why, actually, I agree that there is no kind of um, uh, no uh, how to say that the, the reforms are not 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 really a priority, and they were. Uh, there were backtracks uh, uh, in in many areas, but it's still possible. It's still possible to uh, change this thing, and it's still possible to get uh, get the IMF review uh, by the year end. Okay, <laughs> good luck. Hey. Hey, I would like when the time is uh, passing on, and one of the questions that we need to, uh, to touch up on, and uh, there are many questions here that I can't uh, deal with. Uh, but uh, one uh, important question is we have uh, uh, local election on the 25th of, uh, of October and I uh, remember Alex uh, and I appeared together at uh, Svoboda Slova at a uh, talk show of uh, uh, Savik uh, Schuster on the tele Ukrainian television in March and then you said that you think that it looks as if there will be elections in the fall that the 
local elections will provoke uh, a dissolution of uh, uh, the, the parliament. Do you think this is something or uh, anything else, uh, Alex, you would like to comment on the local elections? Sure. Sure, I, I, I would be happy to. Um, well, uh, first of all, I think it's already logical that Sudan Roda will uh, show very modest results. Uh, people realize that Zelensky, um, you know, his team didn't achieve much um, of what was promised. And um, Sudan Roda is not popular now. Um, so I would think that uh, Slugan will not show a perfect, you know, results, and uh, they will lose, uh, you know, the, the mayors of the big cities will keep their positions. And this is also logical because people would like some stability. Central power gets very weak, unstable, and people, uh, you know, just looking for some kind of stability and incumbent mayors actually, for, in their views, even if they're corrupt, they provide this uh, stability. So what would be the consequence? I think, uh, I don't believe that the, guard, that the parliament would be dissolved. I, uh, you know, situa situation changed since March. I think um, uh, first is uh, parliamentarian themselves will not uh, approve that. Um, and Zelensky, uh, he cannot repeat his trick like he did with the previous uh, communication of, of parliament and dissolve the parliament without any legal reasons. Why? Because uh, he has um, no, uh, you know, he doesn't have enough popularity to do that. So I think this is not the option anymore. So what does it mean? I think it means that, um, you know, there will be uh, less and less reforms and the, the power uh, the government institution will be more and more populistic. That's, that's uh, like, unfortunate, no doubt about that. There is also a question yeah. about new government, uh, the uh, uh, heads of uh, the financial committee in the parliament, uh, uh, Hetman is pushing hard for a change of, in particular, Minister of Finance, also Minister of Economy, your old uh, jobs, Alex and uh, Timothy. Uh, what do you think here? Are the uh, government changes forthcoming soon? Well, uh, well, I don't I... think okay. uh, there is any reason, any reason now to, to change really the government at this stage. Um, during uh, you know during this time during the election time, I said there is no reason. Uh, first of all, and I think the main reason is that I don't think the next government will be better than existing one, um, because there are less and less uh, people who would like to join this strange game, to join the government, to take responsibility, and then being sucked without any explanation. I think Timothy. Uh, you know, know what I'm talking about, at least I felt really bad about the show government because they were stuck without any real explanation. Why? What did they do wrong? Um, and I think that pushed a lot of people, you know, who otherwise would like to join, um, they will not do that. Alex, let me pass on the last word to Timothy. What do you think about all this talk uh, from official sources about a, gov a substantial government change now? Well, there will be some changes. I agree with Alex uh, in the way he puts it, there is no reason. But uh, I think Alex is making a normative statement, you know, that <laughs> things won't be better, you know, or uh, it's unclear that things will be better, you know. So, so but uh, there's definitely a lot of adversity and uh, negative sentiment with respect to the Minister of Finance. With respect to the Ministry of Economy and uh, you know a number of other ministers, but some of the sectoral ministers are supported by oligarchs, so they probably will survive. But the ministers who are uh, the you know, and some other ministers are um, kind of uh, accused of corruption, and uh, they lack substantive support political. So you know, there will be the. It's very likely in the current climate that things uh, will change, and some ministers will be reshuffled. Again, I don't see. I agree completely with uh, with um, Alex that it will fundamentally change the situation. It will address some grievances, of course, and you know, but that's the state of the politics right now in Ukraine. 
Thank you very much to all of you. We have covered a, a lot of ground, uh, a bit more politics than I had expected, but uh, we also covered a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the economics and let us just hope for the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.